Welcome to the Dr. Lori Morris podcast, where she interviews experts in health and science, sharing their expertise so you can live your healthiest life. This episode of the podcast is proudly sponsored by Fit Vegan Coaching, the world's leading whole food plant-based body recomposition program for Gen X and baby boomers. Founded by Maxime, whose personal journey began after losing his ex fiance to breast cancer, Fit Vegan Coaching is on a mission to disease-proof the world through the transformative power of plant-based eating and fitness. This program is a Rolls Royce of plant-based coaching, offering all-inclusive services, personalized plans, world-class accountability, lifelong support, and more. Say goodbye to the yo-yo dieting and embrace a lasting transformation that will rev up your metabolism even post-transformation. Ready to take charge of your health and vitality? Head over to fitvegan.ca. That's fitvegan.ca. And mention Dr. Lori for exclusive bonus savings when you sign up. Don't miss this opportunity to join the movement towards a healthier, fitter, and more vibrant you. This episode of the podcast is proudly sponsored by The Healing Kitchen, your path to vibrant health. Immerse yourself in the transformative program, guided by the combined expertise of myself, Dr. Lori Marbus, and Chef Brittany Giroudi, who has lost 70 pounds on a whole food plant-based diet. Here's what's in store for you. Virtual weekly sessions. Engage in an immersive 60-minute virtual session every single week, where you'll delve into the world of wholesome plant-based goodness right from your own kitchen. Cooking with Brittany the first half hour. Unleash your inner chef as you're captivated by Chef Brittany Giroudi's culinary mastery that will delight your taste buds and nourish your body. Medical Q&A with Dr. Lori the last half hour. Prioritize your well-being during the second half hour. I will personally address your medical inquiries, providing evidence-based insights and personalized advice, empowering you to make informed choices for your health. So join us on the Healing Kitchen to help you step into a healthier and most vibrant future. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Dr. Lori Marvis. Okay, guys. Today... I'm interviewing someone that I've been wanting to interview for a while, and we've just been talking before this recording, and I am so honored that you're here to share our story. So let me let me welcome Dr. Don Masalem. How are you today? Hi, Dr. Marvis. It's really such a privilege to be here. I've followed you for so many years. <laughs> so <laughs> you're like, I, I look up to you. I, in fact, I was talking to some of my colleagues uh, across Mayo Clinic today about bringing you in to talk to our residents. So oh, that would be you're, a you're our lifestyle medicine celebrity and, and accuracy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. I, I <laughs> nothing compared to, yeah, no, uh, Lori, by the way. Yeah, no, no formalities here, but the, uh, your story and it, I, I feel like we're going to get into it, but there's, there's so many aspects of it, but before we get started, you're a physician, which will lead into your story, but can we talk a little bit about why you even wanted to become a doctor and how that evolved and maybe a little bit about your childhood. Cause you know, you'd, you kind of mentioned about your theory of your resilience, but we'll, maybe we can set the stage, but if you can talk a little bit about that, it would be great. Yeah. You know, and I apologize for anyone that's heard me talk about my story before, because sometimes you share a lot of the similar things, but this is, I think so cute in a way, because when I was a little girl, one of my favorite things to do was to watch the today show with Willard Scott, when they would celebrate the 100th birthday celebration. So anyone ha that has watched that will understand what I say next. So when I would be asked, what do you wanna be when you grow up? And my parents would be next to me, I'd say, I wanna be in a Smucker's jar. And people would be like, what on earth is wrong with your kid? And then I would say, and I wanna be a doctor. You know, And what I meant by that is I would like to be 100 years old. I wanna be healthy and I wanna live a long time on earth. And I wanna be a doctor so I can help other people be healthy too. So at a very young age, I, I mean, we're talking three, four, my favorite childhood memory is going to the health food store with my dad. I loved it. And my mom always cooked very healthy. I came from a family of deep love. We just loved each other. I mean, just who we were. We were a very high energy family. We lived very healthy, had a garden. My mom always made homemade bread. I, you name it. Everything was, was healthy, whole foods from the day I was born. And and so this is kind of just in my blood to kind of go down this path of more whole person health. Um, in fact, when I had decided to go to medical school, 
Prior to medical school, I did research at the Cooper Institute where I was studying centenarians and exercise. So I just loved the whole anti-aging or 100 years old thriving, flourishing concept. And I just wasn't quite sure that traditional medical school was a good fit for me because I like more uh, ancient healing systems and I was very curious about them. So I went to naturopathic school before I went to traditional medical school. And then when considering traditional medical school, osteopathic training was a perfect fit for me. And I was in Arizona at the time. And so that's how I selected osteopathic training. I'd always seen osteopathic doctors growing up. And I just really like that kind of holistic scope of practice. It's very fascinating. I mean, many MDs as well as DOs are, are trained and are interested in holistic medicine nowadays. But back in 1996, early 2000, it was a little bit different then. You know, it was a little bit more segregated. But nowadays, I think it's all aligned. I, I do feel mm. that there's certainly doctors in the allopathic community that are very whole person, preventive oriented. And there's some osteopathic doctors that are very allopathically oriented. So it kind of, mm. you know, just really depends on, on the physician's priorities with their own self-care and, and care for what they want to display and, and offer to their patients like you and I. So I love this. If you don't mind, can we speak a little bit more about what you mean by the deep love, because I, I really want to get into this conversation as we get deeper into your story. I feel like there's a real important thing that I, I, I really want to express to people how important this is, is this, this foundational love, unconditional love. Like, could you speak to that a little bit? Like, what does that mean? What did it feel like? How did your parents express it? How did you grow up expressing it? Maybe as, as a parent yourself, like, can we talk a little bit about that? Cause I think it's fascinating. Yeah. You know, and I would say, and this is really an important message to women who have conceived a baby and are pregnant. My mom described being pregnant with me as like her most joyful experience. Like she, she loved, like to this day when she talks about it, she's like so excited when she talks about it. She loved being pregnant. She loved everything about it. She can remember the day I was conceived and every day thereafter until the day I was born. And she said, I was just born this happy child. And I just wonder if that kind of even set the stage. Our emotions are so powerful and we know there's such a direct connection to the fetus. And, and so I think that that's where that just authentic, innate joy ignited was probably in utero is what I would say. And then growing up, we just, we were a family that was, we didn't have a lot of money. It was, we lived a very simple life. We didn't have electronics and fancy things. My parents always wanted us to avoid violence and we weren't allowed to have Ataris and video games. And we, we kind of were very <laughs> censored in what we could watch. I was kind of like in the bubble, if you may. We had strong faith. I was raised Roman Catholic and we attended church every Sunday. And, you know, my parents were, were a little bit active in the church and in regular church groups and things like that. So I feel that faith was a strong component of that foundational love as well and community. And it was a little small town we grew up in. My father was a police officer and my mom was actually the secretary for the school. So, mm -hmm. you know, we were just always kind of this combined family unit. I had one brother and we just had a very harmonious family upbringing. My parents believed that everything I did was the best. It was, it was never necessarily the best. It was like everything we did was like monumental. And it was so cool to have that unconditional support in no matter what it was that we set out to do, both my brother and I. And so, yeah, I, I, I've, I've done a lot of thinking on how did I get through some of the adversity I've had in life and been so able to accept and reframe it as a teacher for kind of the next phase in my life. And, and that I think is why, because I, I know that I'm loved and I have deep love for myself and such deep gratitude just for my own existence to be here today. So it's important that we give that love to our children and to our family in a way that's, that's, that's real, you know, and it's not mm -hmm. about things. It's just about that time and that true emotional connection through the heart and soul. I feel like. Mm -hmm. I think the really important thing to use you is that you have a deep love for yourself and it's not an egotistical love or a narcissistic love. It's a, just a love of you being and existing, like loving that you are magnificent in every other human and sentient being as well. I think that really is key. And um, I think that's, that's it's exciting. Anyway, love is such an important element. And I'm so thankful that you had that opportunity to, to grow up in a home like that because to pull you through and set the foundation for 
all the amazing lessons that you learned that now you're going to be able to share with others. But can we walk into towards college and then medical school and kind of how things progress? Like what was your activities, your, your daily life? And then what happened as you went into medical school? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Lori. And, you know, so my undergraduate studies were in nutrition and exercise physiology, and I was always very involved in, in physical fitness. I was a competitive gymnast growing up, and uh, I did competitive cheerleading and had even started to cheer as I, as I went into college, but I wanted to focus more on my grades. And so I was very involved in aerobics. I, I taught aerobics, uh, you know, all through college. It was step aerobics at the time when you remember that. So I would work out two and three hours a day just because that was my job. I got to get paid for what I exercised. So I'd wake up at four in the morning in college and go teach an aerobics class, go to classes, teach another aerobics class at noon, go to class, teach an aerobics class at five o'clock. I just loved exercise. It was really what it was always about. Um, after undergrad, I even did some fitness competitions, you know, back in the, the 1990s that I thought were a lot of fun, kind of just to display that commitment to, to health. It, it wasn't bodybuilding or anything. It was more just fitness and that disciplined nutrition that I always just really uh, thought was fascinating. And then I went on to do research at the Cooper Institute for Aerobics Research, where I had mentioned on to medical school. And it was in medical school that I experienced my first adversity. And, and about three months into medical school, I wasn't feeling well. I had a little bit of shortness of breath, which is very uncharacteristic for me. This was in Arizona. And at that time, I was no longer teaching aerobics, but I loved to climb mountains. So I would climb Camelback Mountain once or twice a day. Um, and if anyone has done that, it, it's a pretty intense climb. And it just started to get hard for me. So I saw a doctor and he just said, mm, let's try some asthma, use this inhaler. And I didn't think much of it. But, you know, about six weeks went by and it wasn't getting better. It was actually getting worse to the point that doing Camelback now was not even really possible. And it just didn't seem right. And, you know, you go through your mind and I'm thinking, is this stress from medical school? Am I just getting deconditioned because I'm not doing it quite as often as I used to? So I saw a second doctor and this doctor just said, use your inhaler more. It's like, okay. Mm -hmm. So I started using my inhaler more. Now I'm having tachycardia, meaning my heart rate's racing. My shortness of breath is getting dramatically worse. I'm losing weight. I couldn't even walk 10 feet. See another doctor, third doctor, and he said it was in my head. He said it's psychosomatic. It's what happens to all medical students. And I'm just thinking, oh. And then I started really beating myself up because I'm thinking, man, you wimp. How, are, how is this happening? This just is not your personality. I wasn't able to exercise. Going home from medical school a few days later, I collapsed. I was taken to the emergency room. There was a... 15 to 16 centimeter mass wrapped around my heart, all the major vessels, and I was in cardiogenic shock. And they took me to urgent surgery. This was Thanksgiving of 2000. They took me to urgent surgery. They did preliminary pathology. And the next day the doctor came in the room and I was diagnosed with aggressive non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And because it had advanced so far, it was considered stage four disease. So, you know, it was very different back then when you had non-Hodgkin's, uh, especially this diffuse large B-cell type that I had, because we didn't have the therapies we have today. We didn't have the rituximab then. It was just high dose chemotherapy, and there was a high mortality rate associated with this. So um, I had a family member that said, well, how long does she have? <laughs> That's, mm. by the way, family members don't ever ask that question. And um, there, there was a comment about three months. I mean, I was really very, very sick. And, and the concerning thing was is they had to do this major surgery to try to get that tumor off those vessels. So they were worried if they delayed chemo that the tumor would keep on growing. So they had to do chemo very quickly despite doing this large thoracotomy um, surgery and everything else. So started chemo right away. Um, the, the medical team, the doctor on call on that Thanksgiving weekend had said, you won't have kids because we had to start treatment right away. And you need to drop out of medical school because you're going to have serious treatments. And, you know, in medicine, we kind of do some of these things. We, we, we tell people how long they have to live. I, I think that's really God's job. I don't think we should ever predict, you know, I, I am a lifestyle medicine physician in the cancer center at Mayo Clinic. And when I meet with patients that don't want that news, I, I say, well, then let your doctor know. You don't need that news. It's not going to change the management. So if that news is going to kind of change that narrative subtly in your head, possibly, then just maybe ask them not to share the numbers with you. You don't need the numbers. Mm -hmm. The numbers for me kind of really ignited that fight. I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to live to be a hundred. That's my first jar. You're wrong about this one. Uh, so it didn't 
phase me, but I think it could really phase a lot of people. So I, I don't, I don't like that in medicine when we give people so much time to live unless the patient asks for that guess of a number. Um, when they told me to drop out of medical school, that was really difficult because that was my purpose. And I did not drop out of medical school. I stayed in medical school and I attribute my ability to attain my vitality during treatment directly to the fact that I stayed in medical school. Um, <clears throat> so I did many months of chemotherapy because it was such an advanced disease. They did have to do a bone marrow transplant. And this was in 2000. And uh, back then you're kind of like the, the, the girl in the bubble or the patient in the bubble. You know, it, you, they drop your immune system down to nothing with the high dose chemotherapy, more of it. You're in the hospital for, for over a month. And, you know, it was remarkable during this time, as soon as that tumor shrunk down, I was able to start exercising again, you know, and I ate healthy this whole time. And I used allopathic medicine and had a close friend who was a naturopathic uh, physician, Dr. Dan Rubin in Arizona. And he was my naturopathic provider during this time. So I used a very integrative approach. And during that bone marrow transplant, my medical oncologist was, I mean, just such a special human. His name was Dr. Scriber. And he would take time every morning to bring in different jazz music for me to listen to while I would study. And he brought in this statue, something called phrenology, that's a bald head. And he would, he would study my bald head and figure out on the phrenology map, like what, what was wrong with me beyond the fact I had this cancer. And so it was kind of funny. He'd be like, oh, you have this dent here. I think it means you have this wrong with you. So it was real fun. But the cool thing he did is he had a bicycle, two bicycles. One brought into my room so I could ride it whenever I wanted to. And then another one, he put out in the nurse's station, which you're not supposed to leave your room. They said, listen, you wake up at 4 a.m. every morning. I'm fine if you want to sneak out of your room and ride this bike. And he had it looking at the mountain vista so I could watch the sunrise come up. Aww. It gives me chills. It's beautiful. It was so cool. Yeah. So I just remember, I remember one morning getting up to go ride my bike at 4 a.m. I set my alarm every day in the hospital. I wasn't going to change my life so I could study and exercise. And I remember looking out because it was like the circular hospital floor and all the patient rooms were glass doors around it. Everyone was so sick. They were dying in an effort to stay alive. And I was just like this. I don't want to feel sick. Now when I look back at pictures, I look pretty sick. I did not feel sick. I was filled with vitality. Mm. I was so tickled to just be alive and my senses were so heightened. It was the most remarkable experience of one's aliveness you could ever imagine. If I was to die the next day, it was okay because I was more alive in those moments than most people will ever experience in their lifetime. I was so young though, I lost that. Like, like I lost the ability to hold on to that, that huge elevated existence. That was just such a miracle and so cool. So the bone marrow transplant cured my cancer. The, the stage four cancer was gone. I went on to do several months of radiation therapy. So there you go. And stayed in medical school, had a 4.0. Wow. So proved him wrong. I can keep going if you want, but I, I want to make sure you don't have another question because I kind of tend to talk. No, it's that's amazing. So you literally you stayed in medical school with chemotherapy, the surgery, and dealing with oh my goodness, I can't even fathom. So no, it's please keep going. Thing. I'm assuming you became oncologist because of your experience. No, you know, it's it just no. when you, you need a purpose during treatment, you know, you need something to focus on. And, and that's one beautiful thing with lifestyle medicine for patients undergoing cancer treatment is hire doctors you trust. So you can focus on your own health, you know, so you can focus on your nutrition, on how much you're moving your body because movement during chemotherapy actually enhances the chemotherapy effect. We know whole food plant-based nutrition during chemotherapy. Recent studies show that it reduced fatigue. My patients do so well during chemotherapy because they're living this whole person way of life during and after treatment, focusing on sleep, you know, focusing on social connections, focusing on your purpose and having a big reason why you're doing this. And why is that? All of those things matter so much and, and spirituality. So lifestyle medicine in, in, in that way I lived is why I'm alive today. I really believe that. And a large part of me staying in medical school is just that purpose. Mm -hmm. in that knowing that I wanted to help serve the needs of others one day, uh, because I, I just care about people so much. And it's very authentic to, to what I, I want to do in my life back then. And, and I'm so thrilled that I'm able to do that today. Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting though, because after the transplant, 
and radiation. A few years went by and my husband, and I found out we were growing our family. I was pregnant. <laughs> so we were wrong about that too. So yeah, I was written up in a medical, medical journal. I wasn't supposed to get pregnant. I wasn't having <laughs> menstrual cycles. So guess what? Got wow. pregnant. But the first, I think I was the first person after a bovo transplant like that to get pregnant. So they started warning women after that, that listen, you can get pregnant, even if you're not having a period after all that chemo and we shut your ovaries down. Wow. So I had a beautiful baby girl, named Sophia, and she was born in 2003. And a few weeks after she was born though, I, I hit another wall. I started having very similar symptoms to when I had the cancer. And mm. one day I, I, I knew it was, it had gone too far. So they had to take me into the emergency room and I was in cardiogenic shock again, but this time it was because my heart wasn't working. Um, and I was in, uh, my ejection fraction was 8% and I was dilated. I was diagnosed with dilated cardiomyopathy and it was multifactorial. It was from that high dose chemotherapy that was very investigational in an effort to save my life from the cancer that they needed to do. Right. So there's no regrets. I would never take back that chemo because it allowed me to have that baby. It allows me to be alive today. Without that treatment, that cancer would have, would have likely come back. And when it comes back, it's usually untreatable at that point. So I needed that chemo. We can treat the heart failure like they did. That's why I'm here today. Right. Uh, but yeah, I was in advanced heart failure and cardiogenic shock with an ejection fraction of it wasn't even pumping basically. Oh and goodness. they had felt they would have to urgently transplant me at that time. That was in 2003. Okay. And so, you know, the doctors at Mayo Clinic just filled my heart with hope, literally. And they just shared with me that, you know, when the medications no longer work that can support your heart, we'll have to do some different devices. And when that doesn't work, you may need a transplant at some point, but we're going to fight with you along the way. And they enrolled me in cardiac rehabilitation. I was super excited, got stronger and went on to do my residency. Wow. So did residency about two years, I was able to keep up. And this is kind of the course of heart failure. It's a really hard disease, especially for young people. Cause on the outside, you look healthy, but mm -hmm. on the inside, it, it, you're, you're really fighting. You're really fighting for life. And everything is like walking uphill 24 hours a day. Never let people know that, but it, it was a lot of effort to work. So now my life is effortless. <laughs> it's so cool. I'm like, whoa, this is easy life. But then it was tough. And I had a baby that I really, I couldn't even hold her. It was just too heavy for me to hold her. And it's just, it was, it's, it was challenging. But was able to get back to residency and, and was really fulfilled. Got a little bit sick again. So I had to take some time off. And this was in 2007. And the most difficult part of my journey happened around that time when my husband actually experienced sudden cardiac death. And that, um, that's, that's still something I really have a hard time talking about. Um, we had a very loving family unit and I was the one who was sick and was supposed to die, not him. And this wasn't something we planned for at all. And you just don't know what you're going to do. And here I was off of work because I was getting a little sicker at the same time too. And so it was really hard. You know, I wasn't able to resuscitate him. It happened in the middle of the night. And I just remember that joy, you know, I'm just a happy person always. And I just remember it was like that Disney ride where you free fall. It, that's what my joy felt. It just free fell. And I just was flat. I couldn't have any stimulation. I couldn't put the radio on for over a year. I always wondered would I be able to smile again effortlessly, you know, but it really brought me closer to my faith in God in a different way than I had ever had before. Before it was kind of like there's this teaching, like we're Catholic, you go to church, you listen, you receive communion and you go home on Sunday. <laughs> it, it was important, but I didn't really have a direct connection to it until my husband died. And then I developed such deep faith in God and belief in heaven and knowing in heaven, because without heaven, where else was my husband? You know, where else was the father of my daughter's dad. And so my faith is what brought me through. And I just believe that that transformative power of whatever it may be, grief, suffering, pain, it can really move us beyond just merely coping with any of these hardships. And instead we can really transcend into this life of, of awakening or renewal. And it was just so inspiring uh, to be able to, to get through that time, but it was very, very difficult. Um, I would I, I mean, I, I think there was really a miracle, you know, during that 2007, 2008, to when he passed away, they had put one of those devices in my chest and it was called a biventricular pacer. It really didn't help in the beginning, 
but I started getting stronger about a year after he died and I started getting really strong. It was very interesting. And my heart function started actually improving remarkably from going from, you know, that it went from 8% up to the teens, but then all of a sudden it started going up to 20%, 30%, even 40%. Mm-hmm. I was able to go back to work. So I went back to work, finished my residency, did a fellowship in hospital medicine, became a hospital doctor at Mayo Clinic. Like I was like working hard. I was exercising regularly, not able to run, but exercising regularly and living a normal life for for many years until 2015 uh, when I just was starting to burn out again. I I mean, my heart just was at this point where the ejection fraction started coming back down. You know, it's just this course of the disease. So that's when I started the integrative medicine and breast health program built on that foundation of lifestyle medicine. It was easier for me to practice in the outpatient setting than in the inpatient setting at that time. So I transitioned to that program, very successful program. And uh, as we were talking, when we first started off with our conversation this afternoon, uh, Lori, when, before we came on to Zoom, it was September 22nd, 2016, and I had the privilege of presenting to Mayo Clinic leadership about the success of this program and the fact that, hey, these cancer patients are doing amazing. We need to expand this to the entire institution for other patients to reap the benefits of lifestyle medicine and integrative oncology or integrative approaches to care. And during this particular presentation, I felt very, very weak. It wasn't my usual self. And... I lost consciousness and I had a four minute near death experience. Um, and I was in a ventricular fibrillation initially that went into what's called an asystole or just a flat line. My heart just stopped beating. Um, fortunately, I was able to come back to life. It could have been my defibrillator that did bring me back to life. But, you know, Lori, you and I were talking, you know, and in this experience for me, it wasn't like some patients describe where they see a white light. But for me, I just remember this, this, essence of the sense of complete acceptance, the complete unknowing. I had some level of awareness that I was somewhere. I wasn't really quite sure where that was. But the most remarkable experience that I remember feeling was just this overwhelming sense of love. Again, it was just like that childhood love, just that acceptance. And I felt as if I was being like hugged, like someone was hugging me, as if the hands of God were, was, were holding me in this process. I was in no desire to leave this place. And it was such comfort knowing that if that's what dying is about, that it's okay. I was okay with my mortality really during all of this journey. I was never fearful of it. Of course, I never wanted to die. That's why I take good care of my body. But having this experience gave me the knowing that life after a physical life on earth and in that process of what I think is dying is beautiful and it's filled with love and acceptance with no judgment and so it's 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 remarkable like how blessed are I? it's crazy right like to no, go i think it's like, amazing chills. i live with chills i get chills over everything yeah. everything's so meaningful but i get to live in this element of just this raised existence and everything's just so special so I was really sick come 2016, continued to get more sick. I really wasn't able to work very easily at this point. Talking, I would I would almost pass out. Um, they were doing procedure after procedure after procedure to try to fix little things that they could to try to just wait on transplant if they could. And then in 2019, I just could no longer continue. So they listed me for heart transplant in 2019. I waited over a year and there was not one single call and I was getting more and more sick. And so in December of uh, 2020, they had to admit me to the hospital because I was no longer safe to be at home. And so I remained in the hospital until they found the heart for me. So I waited a total of 14 months um, for my heart. And I was on supportive care when when they found the heart. Um, You know, it's interesting. Almost all people believe in organ donation. Everyone believes it's a good thing, but only 58% of people actually register to be an organ donor. There's such an organ shortage. And if my story can stimulate or ignite desire for someone to want to register, please do. You can do it on your iPhone app, talk with your family about your wishes so that there's never any um, hurt feelings in the event something did happen to someone um, that your family doesn't want to support that or they think that maybe you didn't really mean to do that. Make sure there's open dialogue with your family. Um, you can register at your local DMV. So it's very, very important to register to be an organ donor because of the shortage. I'm just one person. and. There are so many organ recipients like myself that are just overflowing with gratefulness for the second chance at life that they were given. 
Um, so it was very interesting. I was in the hospital and one of my you know, good friends, Dr. Patel, who is my transplant cardiologist, my daughter had actually come to visit me for dinner that night. She was a senior in high school and we had had dinner and I was being given medicines that helped beat my heart. So I was able to walk her to the elevator and I saw him by the nurse's station. I was like, oh, someone's going to get their heart tonight. And he's like, Dawn, after she left, I need to talk to you. I was like, oh, no. It was the most awkward walk from the nurse's station back to my room. I remember it's like, the first date. Oh, the date. He's my doctor. I remember it's like, do you put your hands in front of you? You put them behind you? Do you hold them? I was like, I didn't even know how to walk. I like forgot how to do everything. I was so nervous. We walked into my room and I sat in the bed. He sat at the, the head of the bed and he's like, we have a matching heart. And it's so exciting to like say that now, but when he actually told me that, it was like, I was emotionless. Like everything went paused. I felt so guilty that someone had to die for me to continue to live and that my family was going to be rejoicing when someone has to die for us to have this joy where their family is grieving. It's just so hard. And then the other part of it that was so challenging to me was you know, would I lose the memories? Does your heart have memories? Would I lose memories of my beautiful childhood, of all this love, and of my husband who passed away, and of my daughter growing up? Would I lose that? I wasn't sure. And then the next thing he said is, in your donor is an IV drug user with hepatitis C. And that was really hard, you know, and, and I, I, I apply judgment to that, which I've, I've grown so much in this process, not to judge anything, you know, but in that moment, I thought, I don't know, like, is this, is this, is this going to change me if I get the heart of an IV drug user? I'm just this joyful person in my life. What if she didn't? And what if all of a sudden I'm not happy like I used to be? And all this craziness goes through your mind. And I had to think about it. You know, I had to really think if I wanted to accept an IV drug user heart, because there's other risks that go along with that, with other infections, like you can acquire HIV down the road and, and so on and so forth. And a few hours had went by and I all of a sudden had just this, again, that sense of complete knowing that this was totally the right heart for me and that I was going to be able to give this heart, like this woman had this desire to help someone else live. At some point, she checked the box to be an organ donor. And I just paused to think, who better to give this heart that may have struggled at some point in life, the most glorious life on earth. And that's exactly what I'm doing. So mm -hmm. went down for heart transplant. And I remember having contact, eye contact with my surgeon, and there was just this total sense of, it's going to be good. It's going to be okay. In a few days, I'm going to wake up, and I'm going to have my new heart, and I'm going to be healthy again. I'm going to get my life back after 18 years of living with heart failure. And it was the first time I'd ever gone through a surgery, and I had so many surgeries where I wasn't scared. And usually I'd go into surgery, and I'd make the sign of the cross and pray that I would be alive when I'd wake up, but not this one. I knew I'd wake up alive. This one, I was just so filled with gratefulness. I just thanked God for the donor and the donor family and just for their grief in this process. There were a few complications after the transplant. A few days later, I woke up. I was alive. It was super cool. So that near death experience was remarkable. It was like this mystic, miraculous experience. But waking up with the beat of your new heart is the coolest thing ever. I wouldn't want anyone to have to do it, but I wish I could let you feel it because it was so cool. And I remember just hearing this harmonious sound and it was my hair and it was brushing against the crisp white linen sheets in sync to the beat of my new heart. It was so cool. And my body was warm and it had not been warm because it wasn't perfusing for 18 years. And I was like, I'm warm and my mind was clear, like right away I could like think and it was like these crisp thoughts. Mm -hmm. And I just remember feeling like every cell in my body, you know, if people like believe in vibrations, gets kind of a little bit into a little different concept way of thinking, but it was like every single cell in my body was oscillating at this very high vibrational frequency mm -hmm. that human experience was just so incredibly elevated. Mm -hmm. Very similar to what I experienced during my bone marrow transplant, but this time I've not lost it. I refuse to lose it. So I was alive and I, and it was remarkable. And the story gets actually a little bit more interesting. There's, there was a really fascinating dream that happened around this time in the hospital, but I'm going to just pause there and see if you have any questions for me, Laurie, I'm kind of going. On. <laughs> no, now you've got me. Tell me about the dream. No, this is beautiful. I'm just in rapture. Yes. <sighs> 
you're so special. Well, thank you. I mean, thank you for letting me share my story because it is someone else. It is just so remarkable. A life is so remarkable. So it was a few days after transplant and I was kind of angry. I was mad. I was mad I got that IV drug in your heart. The hepatitis C had actually, I acquired it. Mm. And my count started going up to the millions and I'm just like, oh gosh. And I just felt kind of angry. You're on, you're on tons of medicines. At one point I counted how many medicines I was taking, how many pills. I was on 75 pills a day at one point. Holy moly. Wow. And they were multicolored. So it was like, I didn't need colored <laughs> fruits and vegetables. I was getting them in my pills. I was taking so many, I was so pill full. It was ridiculous. But you get a lot of prednisone, tons of prednisone. And I think that was part of it. It was just a little bit cranky one night. Yeah. Like, yeah. Ooh, why me? Why did I get this IV drug in your heart? All these other patients are getting like these the cards. I'm like, oh, I got a triathlete part. Oh, I got a musician part. <laughs> it was so silly. So I went to, to bed this night, kind of in this, not good mood, which is so unlike me. And I woke up in this dwelling place in this dream. It was like this concrete block building. And there was a window and a door. And I remember running to the window to see if my car was there. And there was no car. I remember turning around and looking at the door. There was a chair. See if my purse was there. There was nothing of mine there. It was just a completely a foreign place to me. I remember crawling towards the door. And there were these long blades of grass outside the door. And so I proceeded into the grass and it was like this wind and the grass was just kind of blowing and I continued to crawl in the grass and when you were a kid or even as an adult do you remember when grass would like grab your leg and you it almost would cut your leg like it was so it was so sharp and kind of sticky I, I could mm. feel that like it was almost cutting my leg the feeling of the grass and so with that traction in the grass I kind of flipped over onto my back and overhead of me there was these cumulus clouds it was just beautiful with this breeze and in the distance this is what's remarkable there were these families and they were playing and laughing. And it was like just this like new earth of just joy and love and connection and harmony. Mm. And in that moment, a word came over me and it said grace, mm. like a voice. And so it was very powerful. I woke up and I thought, I'm going to name my heart grace. And I had just a sense of complete fulfillment and peace. And again, that knowing, just that knowing that ever comes that this is meant for me. And it was very calm. I would always listen to instrumental music in the hospital. I just kept it going. And I just happened to look to see what time it was. And the instrumental song playing at that very moment was titled Grace. Oh, wow. And so I couldn't sleep after that. I was like, wow, this is cool. So I thought I'd check my emails. <laughs> I can't sleep. It's like one oh, twenty in the morning, you know? So I checked my emails and the email waiting for me, the very first email waiting was titled Full of Grace. Oh my heavens. It was so fabulous. It was just so phenomenal, you know? And so, you know, grace, if you think about it, it's this divine influence and it operates in each and every one of us to kind of regenerate, you know, regenerate and sanctify and inspire virtue and just impact strength mm. to endure any sort of trial. And so, so I named my heart grace. Mm. And so, you know, prior to my transplant, I had told all my colleagues that I wanted to run a marathon after my transplant. And so I said, I'm going to do this. And in fact, I'm going to do it the one year anniversary because no one else had done it in the world, including men. I was like, I'm going to be the boy. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure though, because it was really hard. Like after the transit, you're really weak. I was very deconditioned because I wasn't able to do anything for so many years beforehand. But, you know, with my whole food plant-based nutrition, with my, uh, you know, desire for exercise and knowledge of exercise physiology, I worked really hard in cardiac rehab and with my exercising, um, as well as that nutrition, I was able to keep on advancing with my running. And mm -hmm. my cardiothoracic surgeon was very supportive to actually let me start running very early. The, the rehab team was even like, he can't do that. I was like, I, he's the surgeon, he, he, he can do that. Yes, he, he can. can do it. He can do it anyway, so he was like, I know what I'm gonna do. It. I'm kind of kidding, I made sure it was safe. And, and I did do it in a very safe way, but uh, at three months, I did my first 5K. At four months, I actually went back and climbed Camelback Mountain the mountain uh, I would always do before I had cancer. Yeah, medical school, yeah. And I continued to do 5Ks. I uh, did a 10-mile race with one of my cardiologists. who He said he wanted eyes on me just to see how I looked when I ran. <laughs> so he did a 10-mile race with me. 
uh, at the six month mark after my transplant. And I joke with him, his name is Dr. Shapiro. He's an amazing physician, great cardiologist. He's our sports cardiologist at Mayo Clinic. And I joke, I said, you almost killed me. He ran me so hard. It was my fastest time ever. <laughs> uh, kind of funny. And so then I did a, I did a half marathon at my 10 month anniversary. And then 11 months after my transplant, I did a, a trial marathon because I didn't want to embarrass myself with the official marathon. So I ran a marathon on my own at the 11th month mark. Mm -hmm. And then on my one year transplant anniversary, it was the breast cancer marathon. It's the marathon oh. that raises money for my patients. So I'm going to run it. So I ran that full marathon on my one year heart transplant anniversary. But it, the reason I bring this story up, number one, it is a testament that the power of whole food plant-based nutrition is beyond what anyone could ever imagine because that was that should have been physically impossible with all the medicines I was on and the, the, the side effects of those medicines and just the recovery with with what's entailed with the heart transplant, but I was able to do it. It was remarkable. Mm. But at the finish line of the marathon, there was this big construction sign. It was like two stories high. And guess what the construction sign said? No, it did not. Did it say Grace? Grace. It did not. I, I should see if I have a picture. I can pull it up. It's, wow. It was Grace and my colleague at the end of the finish line, one of my good friends, she's an ER doctor at Mayo and one of our amazing nurse practitioners who does Ironman triathlon after Ironman triathlon. They both met up with me about two or three miles towards the finish line to kind of come in with me. And so they saw it, they're like, Dawn, look at that. And I was like, oh my goodness. So they got the coolest picture of it. It's coming across oh, the finish line with it. That is so, incredible. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so that's the story. And it's just been so remarkable to be able to um, be fully alive and to be in that position to help guide my patients, you know, during their own cancer journeys. And I do see transplant patients as well. Those who hear kind of what I do in medicine to help guide them towards this whole person health. But, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think at the foundation, a lot of us always think it's food, you know, the food part of it, because that's what people get excited about. But like you and I were talking, I think there's a lot more deep concepts to the whole lifestyle medicine realm that matter to make um, human flourishing possible. Mm. So. Mm. so this alone is amazing. Like the, the gold nuggets that you have presented today, there's so many lessons that we can all take. How, how do you feel? How do you feel that you get this? ongoing resiliency I mean there's just so many things that other people really struggle with that are in my opinion half a third of the battle that you've been through your entire life <laughs> it's one struggle but you keep bouncing back kind of like you know when you're a kid do you have those where you blow up and you punch it and it pops yeah. back oh yeah I'm smiling I'm going <laughs> that's kind of like <laughs> so how how do you how do you uh, do that like where do you feel like that comes from like how how does someone how would you guide someone to maybe searching within themselves to find that strength yeah you know I think I think it's multifactorial I think you know like I like that word grittiness like like how do you keep gritty during some of this stuff number one for me it was never letting go of that really that goal-directed mission of delivering original medicine through that lens of love for, for humanity, like helping people. My purpose was outside of me and holding onto that purpose tight. So whatever your purpose is, it doesn't have to be being a doctor, but just something that serves the greater good and, and something that's built on a foundation of love. I think love is so important. Like I, I tell my patients, I love them. I say, I was leaning with my nurse. I'm like, I love you. You like, I just love life. And I love people. And I think that that is such a nurturing way to live and exist. So Number one, it would it would be that having purpose and maybe something that tries to align with with the greater good of, of life in the world and always remembering that, you know, life is about something so much far bigger than us. If we're so focused inward on us, then then everything is going to be catastrophizing, right? Everything's going to be problematic because it's only about you. But when it's not about you and it's about something far greater than you, your problems just seem very puny that way. So that worked for me. You know, the next thing is I kind of always flip the script on whatever it was on cancer or heart failure or major grief from the loss of a loved one. I try to find meaning in it. It's very hard to do that when it's loss. I will say it was very difficult. It was also much diff more difficult when I had heart failure than cancer because when mm. I had cancer, it was only me. I didn't have a family. I could be selfish. And if I did die, it was just me. My parents would have been very sad, but it was just me. 
But then when I had a heart there, I had a baby and I had a daughter that was then in college and, and I had to be there for her, you know? And so then all of a sudden me dying was going to hurt someone else. So I, I did my best to kind of flip that script on those various adversities I had to reframe them as a teacher of life. And what could I learn from them? What meaning could I develop? And I think it really helped me to attain a life that was filled with, with quite blissful existence during this time. Um, you know, when we have hardship, we can go down that path of post-traumatic stress. We can go down that path of post-traumatic growth. And for me, each level of adversity brought me to a place of higher existence. It got better and better and better. And so I just trust that. It's like a springboard of life. And, and right now I'm like at the tip top level of my existence. Like there's not one aspect of my life I would change. And, and I had a meeting prior to us joining on this call, Lori, with an amazing colleague of mine that actually was homeless as a young girl growing up. And, and she mm. actually does joy work for Mayo Clinic now. I mean, it gives me chills. I'm like, man, here's a woman that didn't have love growing up, mm. potentially. You know, I don't know her whole story, but I'm, I'm imagining there was, there was a lot of loss and there was a lot of, of trauma is how she described it. I had none of that. I had love. I had all, all the support my whole life. So I look at what I went through is so minimal compared to the suffering that many other people go through. And I would say the probably the most important thing we have to always keep in mind, the third thing for me was that I was just filled with gratitude and gratefulness. I was so grateful for that love for my family. I was so grateful for my colleagues. Oh my gosh, they were so supportive and they were still so supportive of me. And my medical team, you know, those doctors that I hired that I knew would take good care of me. Oh my gosh. And the nurses and the people that come in to clean your room and the people that take your food order in the hospital. Everyone at Mayo Clinic Hospital, they took such good care of me. And it wasn't because I worked there. They take the same level of care for everyone. It was just like good health care. And most importantly, I'm so grateful that I had belief in God, you know, and that I have strong belief in God and, and something that is a guiding force for me and, and, and some something I can always rely upon when things get hard or difficult. And so that gratitude can really take us from that place of deficit and, and really shift us towards abundance. So, so I think the gratitude matters. You know, I know a lot of patients of mine, they do gratitude journaling and, and it helps them. If you can find something grateful for, it's going to kind of put you into a more positive scope, I think, right away as soon as you start thinking of that. Mm, I think that's yeah. fabulous. So does, do you feel that gratitude can lead to that self-love because I think it's the really important piece, at least that I'm gathering is that the self-love piece allows you to radiate this abundance and always thankfulness. Like how do you, how would you help someone cultivate that self-love? It's because a lot of sometimes people feel uh, victimized from something, some tragedy, or maybe they feel out of control or they're not worthy, or this is happening because they're not worthy of the love. How do we, how do we help people navigate? Like, do you have conversations with people to help them? That's such a good question, Lori. And, and it's so easy for me. And maybe it's easy for you because I came from that place of love. And when you meet people that have gone through trauma, I really do lean in and rely on my social workers, my stress management and mindfulness providers, some of my psychology uh, folks in the cancer center to really work through some of that deep seated trauma work. And, and we have to, and I am not a professional in that space, but I do really refer a lot of those patients to do some of that deep trauma work and introspection to be able to open up to that vulnerability in a safe way, because I think it can be very scary for some of them. For example, I mean, I have some patients that have had that major trauma and for them, mindfulness or meditation or prayer or yoga is, is awful. It's an awful experience for them because all those thoughts come flooding in. So I really like for some of these, you know, individuals who've been trained in this space to kind of work people through that. Um, and again, I, I feel like that's where I'm just so grateful that I really never had to go through that. Mm. And that's where I think that my journey is so much easier than people who have had to experience that. Maybe my donor, for example, you know, I don't know, but that's what's such a joy to be able to, to live in this, in this way to even maybe if there is an element of memory or emotion of a heart to be able to give her that gift, the gift of my life and, and how glorious that is. Mm. But that's such a good question. And when I'm with my patients, I just listen, you know, when I ask those questions and, you know, when it comes to love of self and others, we have to remove judgment. And that is something that I clearly learned during my transplant process, you know, with 
with IV drug use. It doesn't mean she was a bad person. I don't know her circumstances, you know, and I, I, I don't know what that was. And so removing judgment is so important. And, and we need to do that globally in life, you know, in mm -hmm. so many dimensions and so many levels and just love one another unconditionally and be kind, mm -hmm. like you were saying earlier. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fantastic. Well, I know I've kept you your hour and I want to be respectful of your time. So is there any final words you'd like to share with the audience? Because I, I feel like I could ask you questions all day, but is there any final words or things that you'd like to share that's on your heart to, to someone? No, I'll share with them the little quote that one of my mentors shared with me about how when the heart beats, it keeps 5% of the blood for itself before it can pump blood to the rest of the body. So it's a good message, right? You got to show up for yourself. Take good care of your body. Follow Dr. Laurie Marvin. She has such yes. amazing lifestyle medicine recommendations. You're so inspiring yourself and, and everything you stand for with the pillars of lifestyle medicine and, and myself as well. Show up for yourself and apply those pillars. But I feel the most important thing about that statement is 95% of the blood is going other places in the body. So, so I use that analogy kind of to just to highlight the importance of, of serving the needs of others, be there for other people in a kind, loving way, and, and just try to help the world be a better place. It's so important. Mm, I love that analogy because it reminds me when you were stating when you got your heart transplant, how suddenly your body was alive. You were warm and you were, you're, you're vibrating at this higher level. But your heart had to be in a place that it could feed itself first that allowed it to feed everything else. And just like your life, right? You feed yourself first. That allows you to be more present and more loving towards everyone else. I think it's a beautiful analogy and you've lived it. <laughs> it's amazing. So you're so kind. Oh, you. oh, oh my goodness gracious. I think that's fabulous. So well, thank you so much, Dawn. And I'm sure this will be one for people to listen over and over again and share with others that um, you're quite an inspiration. And thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. Oh, it's been my pleasure, Lori. I'm so honored and privileged to know you. So thank you for having me here.